Hello everyone. In this video, we'll be dealing with physics questions from NEET paper 2022. So let's start with the first question. This question is from the chapter electromagnetic waves. And here we have to match different types of electromagnetic waves with their wavelengths mentioned in list 2. Okay. So this is simply memory based question. You can easily solve this if you know about the electromagnetic spectrum. So you have to remember this sequence. Okay. So let me draw this electromagnetic spectrum so here we'll i'll be mentioning the wavelengths of different types of waves in decreasing order okay so the first one is radio wave the second one is microwave third one is infrared fourth is visible light fifth is ultraviolet radiation then the next is x-rays and the last is gamma rays okay now let me mention the wavelengths so the least wavelength is for gamma rays it is somewhere 10 to the power minus 12 to minus 15 okay for x-rays it is between 10 to the power minus 9 to 10 to the power minus 10 uvs have wavelength around 10 to the power minus 7 to 10 to the power minus 8 Whereas for visible light, it is 10 to the power minus 6 to minus 7 or you can say around 10 to the power minus 7. Okay. For infrared, it is 10 to the power minus 4 to 10 to the power minus 5. For microwaves, it is about 10 to the power minus 2. And for radio, it will be 1 meter to 100 meter or you can say 10 to the power 2 meter. Okay. So all are in meter. Now let's match the correct option here. First one is AM radio waves. So we know that radio waves have maximum wavelength. It is in decreasing order, right? So first one is the maximum and the last one is the least. So the radio wave waves have maximum wavelength. That means 1 meter to 100 meter. So here it is mentioned 10 to the power 2 meter. So this will be the correct answer. So the match for A will be number 2. Okay. Now the next one is microwaves. So here also you can see that the next is microwave with wavelength 10 to the power minus 2 meter so the correct match for b will be number 3 okay so number 3 now the next is infrared radiation here also you can see that after microwaves infrared comes so it has the wavelength around 10 to the power minus 4 to minus 5 here in the options we have 10 to the power minus 4 so we can write that the correct match for c is number 4 okay and the last one is x-rays you can see here it is between 10 to the power minus 9 to minus 10 and in the options we have 10 to the power minus 10 so this will be the correct match for this that means the match for d is number one so out of the given options option d will be the correct answer now question number two is from the chapter thermodynamics and the question is an ideal gas undergoes four different processes from the same initial state as shown in the figure below those processes are adiabatic isothermal isobaric and isochoric okay so the curve which represents the adiabatic process among 1 2 3 and 4 is okay so let's first understand the meaning of these terms adiabatic isothermal isobaric and isochoric okay first one is adiabatic so the process in which heat is neither absorbed nor released is known as adiabatic process so i'm writing constant heat okay because the amount of heat remains same now the next one is isothermal iso means same and thermal is related to temperature so in this case the temperature remains constant okay now the next one is isobaric again iso means same and bar is the unit of pressure so it means that in this process the pressure remains constant and the last one is isochoric Coric is related to volume. So in this case, the volume remains constant. Okay. So you have to keep these things in mind. Now let's have a look at the graph shown here. In the first graph, this one, you can see that the pressure is increasing, but the volume is same. Okay. At this volume, the pressure is increasing continuously. So same volume means what? It is isochoric. Okay, so here we can write that the first graph is isochoric. 
okay now similarly for the fourth one you can see that the volume is increasing continuously but the pressure is same okay at this pressure the volume is increasing so the fourth one is isobaric because pressure is same so in front of isobaric we can write it is graph number 4 okay but we have to find out the adiabatic graph so out of 3 and 2 we might get confused because they are more or less similar in shape okay now to find out which should be adiabatic and which one should be the isothermal we can consider this equation dp by dv that means change in pressure with respect to volume in case of adiabatic is equal to minus gamma into p okay whereas dp by dv in case of isothermal is equal to minus p okay so which one is greater first one in case of adiabatic this dp by dv is greater and this graph is nothing but the dp by dv okay so here we can say that for adiabatic it is greater than the isothermal okay so when this is greater then the graph should be steeper for adiabatic that means this number 2 is the steeper graph so this should be for adiabatic so here we can write this is graph number 2 whereas graph number 3 will be for isothermal okay so we have to answer about adiabatic so it should be graph number 2 that means option b will be the correct answer question number 3 is from the chapter systems of particles and rotational motion and the question is the angular speed of a fly wheel moving with uniform angular acceleration changes from 1200 rpm to 3120 rpm in 16 seconds the angular acceleration in radian per second square is okay so here we can see that the speed is mentioned in terms of rpm whereas the answer is asked in terms of radian per second square so for that we'll first convert the speed in radian per second okay so we know that 1 rpm is equal to 2 pi by 60 radian per second so the first or initial angular speed will be equal to 1200 rpm or 1200 into 2 pi by 60 radian per second isn't it similarly omega 2 will be equal to 3120 into 2 pi by 60 radian per second now we know that angular acceleration is the rate of change of angular speed that means omega 2 minus omega 1 divided by time taken okay so here omega 2 is 3120 into 2 pi by 60 minus omega 1 is 1200 into 2 pi by 60 okay divided by time taken that means 16 seconds here it is given 16 seconds so now we can take the 2 pi by 60 as common 2 pi by 60 and under bracket what will be left 3120 minus 1200 divided by 16 okay so here on solving this 3120 minus 1200 will get 1920 divided by 16 so again dividing 1920 by 16 will get 120 okay so 16 to 2 is 120 so 2 pi into 2 that means 4 pi right so 4 pi will be the answer here option b is the correct answer question number 4 is from the chapter semiconductor electronics and here we are given three different circuits and it is asked that in the given circuits a b and c the potential drop across the two pn junctions are equal in okay so what is the condition for the potential drop to be equal for that both the junctions should be forward bias or reverse bias so let's write it down both the junctions should be forward bias or both the junctions should be reverse bias okay now let's try to understand what we mean by forward and reverse bias we know that p means positive side that is the majority charge carriers on this side is holes and the n denotes the negative side that means the majority charge carriers on this side are electrons okay 
now this is the terminal of the battery so the bigger line represents the positive terminal whereas the smaller line represents the negative terminal of the battery now if the positive side of the semiconductor is connected with the positive side of the battery and the negative side of the semiconductor is connected to the negative side of the battery then it is known as forward bias okay and what will be reverse bias just the opposite of this that means if n side will be connected to the positive and p side will be connected to the negative then that will be the reverse bias right so here let's see in the first one we see that this is the positive p that is connected to the positive side that means the bigger line similarly this side n is connected to the smaller line that means the negative terminal so this is forward bias right similarly for the third one you can see that n side is connected to the smaller terminal that means negative terminal and p side is connected to the positive terminal that is the bigger line so this is also forward bias isn't it what is the case in second one here p is connected to the positive this is okay but this side p is connected to the smaller line that means negative so this is reverse bias okay so only a and c are forward bias that means the potential drops across the two pn junctions will be same in a and c okay so the correct option will be option d that is both circuits a and c the potential drops across the junctions will be equal okay question number 5 is from the chapter ray optics and optical instruments and the question is a biconvex lens has radii of curvature 20 cm each if the refractive index of the material of the lens is 1.5 then the power of the lens is okay so here we have a biconvex lens that means the lens has two convex parts okay but the direction of both the convex parts is opposite so if one of the radius of curvature is positive then the other radius of curvature will be negative right so here both are 20 cm in magnitude that means if r1 is equal to 20 cm then r2 will be equal to minus 20 cm right now the refractive index that is mu is 1.5 if we write it in fraction then we'll get 15 by 10 that is equal to 3 by 2 okay so what will be the focal length we can find it using the formula 1 by f equals to mu minus 1 into 1 by r1 minus 1 by r2 okay so mu is 3 by 2 here minus 1 1 by r1 that means 1 by 20 minus this side we have minus 20 so minus 1 by 20 okay so 3 by 2 minus 1 is 1 by 2 and this side we have 1 by 20 plus 1 by 20 okay so here we'll get 1 by 2 into on solving this we'll get 2 by 20 so we will get 1 by 20 centimeter so this is the value of 1 by f so what will be the focal length it will be the inverse that means 20 centimeter right now we have to convert it into meter okay in order to get the power okay so 20 centimeter means what 20 into 10 to the power minus 2 meter now we can get the power of the lens that is equal to 1 by f in meter that means 1 by 20 into 10 to the power minus 2 so 10 to the power minus 2 will be 10 to the power 2 when it will move up that means 10 to the power 2 that is 100 divided by 20 so it should be 5 diopter okay diopter is the unit of power of the lens so option c will be the correct answer here 5 diopter Question number 6 is from the chapter dual nature of radiation and matter and the question is the graph which shows the variation of the de Broglie wavelength lambda of a particle and its associated momentum P is okay. So we know that the de Broglie wavelength lambda is given by the expression H by P where H is the Planck's constant and its value is fixed and the P is momentum of the particle okay. So Planck's constant will remain same. So de Broglie wavelength will vary inversely with the momentum. So the graph for the inverse relation is something like this. So which of the options should be correct? Option D, right? So option D is the correct answer here. 
question number 7 is from the chapter current electricity and the question is as the temperature increases the electrical resistance option a increases for both conductors and semiconductors option b decreases for both conductors and semiconductors option c increases for conductors but decreases for semiconductors and option d decreases for conductors but increases for semiconductors okay so here we just have to remember that the conductors have positive temperature coefficient okay what do you mean by positive temperature coefficient it means that as the temperature will increase then the resistance will also increase okay similarly semiconductors will have negative temperature coefficient that means as temperature increases resistance will decrease okay so here which option should be correct option c okay the resistance increases for conductors but decreases for semiconductors question number 8 is from the chapter mechanical properties of fluids and the question is a spherical ball is dropped in a long column of a highly viscous liquid the curve in the graph shown which represents the speed of the ball v as a function of time t is suppose this is the ball we are talking about okay initially it is at rest so at that point the velocity is zero right now if we draw the velocity versus time graph this side then the initial velocity should be zero that means it should start at the origin point okay now after it has been released from here the only force that will be acting on the ball will be the force of gravity due to which the speed of the ball will increase very fast so the ball will start moving fast and here the graph will be something like this but after it is dropped in a highly viscous liquid two more forces will be acting on it in the opposite direction and these will be the viscous force and the baryon force so these forces will oppose the force of gravity due to which the speed will decrease okay so after some time the speed will decrease and finally become constant okay so the graph should look something like this so which which curve should be the correct answer curve b okay this is the correct representation of the given situation so option b will be the correct answer question number 9 is from the chapter magnetism and matter and the question is the dimensions m l t minus 2 a minus 2 belong to the options are magnetic flux self inductance magnetic permeability or electric permittivity okay so let's find it out by checking one by one okay so the first one is magnetic flux that is represented as phi so what is the formula for magnetic flux phi is equal to b into a where b is the magnetic field and a is the area okay and magnetic field is equal to force by current into length and here we have area as well so let's write down the dimensions of each of them so the dimension of force is m l t minus 2 dimension of area is l2 and dimension of current is a and l length is l okay so on solving this we'll get the dimension of the magnetic flux that is equal to m l2 t minus 2 a minus 1 okay so this does not match with the given data so this is not the correct answer okay now we come to the second one that is self inductance it is represented as capital l so self inductance is nothing but magnetic flux divided by current so this is the magnetic flux if we divide it by current we'll get what ml2 t minus 2 a minus 2 instead of a minus 1 okay so this is also not the correct answer because this also does not match with the given data now we come to the third one okay that is magnetic permeability so that we can find out using the self inductance because self inductance is equal to mu not n square a divided by l so mu not is the magnetic permeability n n is the number of turns a is the area and l is the length so what will be the magnetic permeability it will be equal to self inductance l into length divided by n square a right so here the dimension of self inductance is given here we have just found out it is ml2 t minus 2 a minus 2 okay length is l 
n is number of turns so it is a dimensionless quantity so only area will be there that means l2 will be there okay now if we solve this what will we get we'll get m l t minus 2 a minus 2 right so is this quantity same as mentioned in the question this is same right so magnetic permeability will be the correct answer that means option c is the correct answer here Question number 10 is from the chapter Semiconductor Electronics and the question is in half wave rectification if the input frequency is 60 Hz then the output frequency would be and the options are 0, 30 Hz, 60 Hz and 120 Hz. Okay. So this is very simple. We just have to remember that in case of half wave rectifier the output frequency is equal to the input frequency. Right. So the input frequency in this case is 60 Hz. So the output frequency will also be equal to 60 Hz. Okay. So option C will be the correct answer. Question number 11 is from the chapter waves. And the question is if the initial tension on a stretched string is doubled, then the ratio of initial and final speeds of a transverse wave along the string is. Okay. So suppose this is a string and it has been stretched. Then the speed of the transverse wave on this stretched string is given by the formula V equals to root under T by mu where T is the tension on the string and mu is the mass per unit length of the string that will remain constant. Okay. That means the speed will vary directly with root T. So suppose the initial speed is root under T by mu then what will be the final speed it will be root under 2t by mu because the tension has been doubled according to this question okay and mu will remain constant that means if we find the ratio of initial speed to final speed that will be equal to root under t divided by root 2t right so here the ratio will be 1 by root 2 okay so which should be the correct answer option c 1 is to root 2 will be the correct answer here question number 12 is from the chapter systems of particles and rotational motion and the question is a shell of mass m is at rest initially it explodes into three fragments having mass in the ratio 2 is to 2 is to 1 if the fragments having equal mass fly off along mutually perpendicular directions with speed v then the speed of the third or the lighter fragment is okay so we know that the momentum of the system always remains conserved. That means the initial momentum should be equal to the final momentum, isn't it? And what is the initial momentum? Mass into initial velocity. And what is initial velocity? It is zero because the shell was at rest initially. Okay. So initial momentum will be zero. Therefore, the final momentum should also come out to be zero. Just remember this. Now we have the, these three fragments. Okay. So let's write down the masses of these three fragments as M1, M2 and M3. So according to the question, these are in the ratio 2 is to 2 is to 1. That means M1 is equal to 2M. Then M2 is also equal to 2M and M3 is equal to M. Right? Now, according to this question, the uh, fragments having equal masses, that means these 2M and 2M, these fly off along mutually perpendicular directions that means if one move towards x axis then the other moves towards the y axis right and they move with speed v that means v1 is v and v2 is also v and v3 is unknown and this is what we have to find out in this question okay now we know that m1 moves towards x axis and m2 moves towards y axis and what is the unit vector along x axis it is i cap right whereas the unit vector along y axis is j cap so if we write the momentum of the first particle that means p1 it will be equal to 2 mv into i cap because it is moving along the x direction for the second particle momentum will be equal to 2 mv j cap because it is moving towards x y axis okay and momentum of the third particle or the third fragment will be m into v3 v3 is unknown we have to determine it okay now what will be the net 
momentum of the first and second particle let's find it out net momentum of m1 and m2 it is root under 2 mv square plus 2 mv square right now if we solve it we'll get 2 root 2 mv okay so this is the net momentum and it will be somewhere here along this line okay so we know that the final momentum should be zero and the net momentum of 1 and 2 is this that means the momentum of the third particle should be like this so that it can cancel it out and the net momentum comes out to be zero okay so only the direction will be opposite but the magnitude should be same that means the momentum of the third particle that means mv3 should be equal to 2 root 2 mv okay so mm cancelled so what will be the value of v3 it will be equal to 2 root 2 v got it so this will be the required velocity of the third particle so option c will be the correct answer got it now this question is again from the chapter systems of particles and rotational motion and the question is two objects of mass 10 kg and 20 kg respectively are connected to the two ends of a rigid rod of length 10 meter with negligible mass the distance of the center of mass of the system from the 10 kg mass is okay so if this is the x axis this is the y axis then let's assume that one end of the rod is put at the origin of this coordinate system okay that means at the point 0 0 whereas the other end of the rod will be at a distance 10 meter on the x axis and y axis will be 0 okay so this will be 10 0 now so here m1 that means first mass is kept at the origin point and it is 10 kg whereas m2 that means 20 kg mass is kept at the other end so x1 in this case is 0 whereas x2 is 10 right now center of mass can be easily found out using the formula m1 x1 plus m2 x2 divided by m1 plus m2 okay so m1 is 10 kg x1 is 0 because it is kept at the origin right now m2 is 20 and x2 is 10 because it is kept at the 10 meter distance divided by m1 plus m2 that means 10 kg plus 20 kg so here this will be 0 this will be 200 divided by 30 so on solving this we'll get 20 divided by 3 meter that means option b will be the correct answer question number 14 is from the chapter mechanical properties of fluids and the question is if a soap bubble expands the pressure inside the bubble options are decreases increases remains the same or is equal to the atmospheric pressure so we know that the pressure inside the soap bubble is equal to the pressure outside plus 40 by r that means the excess pressure or delta p is equal to 40 by r and we can say that the excess pressure is inversely proportional to r okay what is r it is the radius of the bubble and t is the surface tension of water right so on expanding the bubble the radius will increase so let's write it down on expanding the soap bubble radius increases therefore excess pressure decreases okay because it is inversely proportional to r that means option a will be the correct answer question number 15 is from the chapter work energy and power and the question is an electric lift with a maximum load of 2000 kg that consists of the mass of lift plus mass of passengers is moving up with a constant speed of 1.5 meter per second the frictional force opposing the motion is 3000 newton then the minimum power delivered by the motor to the lift in watts is okay an acceleration due to gravity is to be taken as 10 meter per second square so now the total load is the total mass that is moving up so what will be the force that means f1 equals to mass into acceleration due to gravity so total mass that is moving up is 2000 kg 
and the acceleration due to gravity is to be taken as 10 meter per second square then the force will be 20000 newton okay because newton is the unit of force now the second force here is the frictional force that is given as 3000 newton so what will be the total force while moving up it will be the sum of f1 and f2 that means 20000 plus 3000 newton okay so what will be the value it will be 23000 newton right now we have to find out the minimum power delivered so that will be equal to force into velocity why because we know that power is equal to work by time and work can be written as force into displacement right so displacement divided by time is nothing but velocity so we can write it as force into velocity right so here the total force we found out it is 23000 newton and the velocity is given as 1.5 meter per second so if we multiply this we will get 34500 and the unit of power will be watt okay so the correct option will be option c Question number 16 is from the chapter electrostatic potential and capacitance and the question is the angle between the electric lines of force and the equipotential surface is options are 0 degree, 45 degree, 90 degree and 180 degree. Okay, so we know that the change in potential that is dv is given by the expression vector e dot d vector r. Okay, so the dot product is minus e dr cos theta. Now, we know that for equipotential surface, the potential will remain same at all the points. That means the change in potential will be zero. So we can write that dv will be equal to zero. So minus e dr cos theta will also be zero. So here we can write cos theta is equal to zero. So what will be the value of theta? It will be equal to cos inverse zero degree that will come out to be 90 degree okay so option c will be the correct answer question number 17 is from the chapter dual nature of radiation and matter and the question is when two monochromatic lights of frequency v and v by 2 are incident on a photoelectric metal their stopping potential becomes vs by 2 and vs respectively the threshold frequency for this metal is that means we have to find out the v naught okay so we know that the maximum kinetic energy that is k max is given as e into vs where vs is the stopping potential and that is equal to hv minus phi phi is binding energy that is equal to hv naught so here we can write hv minus hv naught okay now two conditions are given here so let's write this equation two times okay and evs equals to hv minus hv naught and one more times we'll write evs equals to hv minus hv naught now in the first condition it is given that the frequency is v and the stopping potential is vs by 2 so the frequency will be v and the stopping potential will be vs by 2 so we'll write vs by 2 here and this will be the first equation and in the second condition the vs that means the stopping potential remains same but the frequency is v by 2 so hv by 2 will be written here so this will be the equation number 2 now we can see that in equation 2 the value of evs is given as hv by 2 minus hv naught so we can put the value of evs in equation 1 okay so let's write the equation 1 again here we can write half and in place of evs we can write hv by 2 minus hv naught okay so let's write it hv by 2 minus hv naught and that will be equal to hv minus hv naught okay now opening the bracket we'll get hv by 4 minus hv naught by 2 equals to hv minus hv naught okay now if we bring the v naught on one side and v on the other side then we'll get here hv naught minus hv naught by 2 equals to hv minus hv by 4 okay so here we'll get hv naught by 2 equals to 3 hv by 4 
so we can say that v not is equal to 3 v by 2 okay so what will be the correct answer here it will be option uh, d sorry option d okay question number 18 is from the chapter magnetism and matter and the question is a long solenoid of radius 1 mm has 100 turns per mm if one ampere current flows in the solenoid then the magnetic field strength at the center of the solenoid is so we know that the magnetic field strength is written as capital b and that is equal to mu not ni where mu not is a constant n is the number of turns per unit length and i is the current okay so we know that mu not by 4 pi is equal to 10 to the power minus 7 then what will be the value of mu not it will be equal to 4 pi into 10 to the power minus 7 okay so let's put this value here 4 pi into 10 to the power minus 7 now what is n n is the number of turns per unit length here it is given as 100 turns per millimeter that means 100 turns by 10 to the power minus 3 meter okay so it can be written as 100 into 10 to the power 3 turns per meter okay so let's put this value here 100 that means 10 to the power 2 into 10 to the power 3 okay and the current is 1 ampere now let's solve it 4 pi into 10 to the power minus 2 because minus 7 plus 3 is minus 4 and then minus 4 plus 2 will be minus 2 okay so this is the value but we have to bring decimal value so how can we bring this we can write the value of pi here we know that pi is equal to 3.14 so 4 into 3.14 into 10 to the power minus 2 so it will come out to be 12.56 into 10 to the power minus 2 and the unit will be tesla so which option will be correct option b will be the correct answer question number 19 is from the chapter nuclei and the question is in the given nuclear reaction the element x is so this is the reaction we can see that sodium is getting disintegrated into an element x plus positron plus a neutrino so this is a type of beta decay okay and let's write down the reaction once again here we have a sodium its atomic number is 11 and the mass number is 22 so it is disintegrating into the element x now suppose the atomic number of x is z and the mass number of x is a okay and then we have a positron so its atomic number will be 1 and the mass number will be 0 and then we have a neutrino okay so by the conservation of atomic number so we can write from conservation of atomic number that means the atomic number will remain conserved so the atomic number of the element x plus the atomic number of the positron will be equal to the atomic number of sodium okay so z plus 1 will be equal to 11 so what will be the value of z it will be equal to 11 minus 1 that means 10 so which element has atomic number 10 it is neon okay now similarly we can find from the conservation of mass number the total mass number will be conserved that means the mass number of the element x that is a plus the mass number of the positron that is 0 will be equal to the mass number of sodium that means 22 okay so what will be the value of a it will be 22 minus 0 that is 22 so the element will be neon with atomic number 10 and mass number 22 right so option c will be the correct answer question number 20 is from the chapter moving charges and magnetism and the question is given below are the two statements first statement is biot savart's law gives us the expression for the magnetic field strength of an infinitesimal current element ideal of a current carrying conductor only so this is a correct statement according to the biot savart's law d vector b is given as mu not by 4 pi into i dl cross vector r divided by r cube okay so this is applicable for infinitesimal element therefore statement 1 is correct okay now statement 2 is biot savart's law is analogous to coulomb's inverse square law of charge q with the former being related to the field produced by a scalar source id whereas the latter being produced by a vector source q 
so this is a wrong statement actually it is half correct because this is true that biot savart's law is analogous to coulomb's law but here you can see in biot savart's law this is related to the vector source ideal okay ideal is the vector source not the scalar source but here it is given that id is scalar source so this is incorrect and similarly the latter being produced by vector source q so coulomb's law is not related to the vector source q but the q is the scalar source in coulomb's law okay so again this is just the opposite therefore statement 2 will be incorrect that means statement 1 is correct and statement 2 is incorrect so option c will be the correct answer question number 21 is from the chapter systems of particles and rotational motion and the question is the ratio of radius of gyration of a thin uniform disc about an axis passing through its center and normal to its plane to the radius of gyration of the disc about its diameter is okay so here we will find the radius of gyration in two conditions first about an axis passing through the center and second about the diameter and then we'll find the ratio of these two okay so i'll draw rough diagrams for these two conditions okay so in the first condition we have to find the radius of gyration about this axis whereas in the second condition we have to find the radius of gyration about the diameter okay so the moment of inertia for these two conditions will be we know that it is equal to m r square by 2 for the first condition whereas it is given as m r square by 4 for the second condition right so this you have to remember now what will be the radius of gyration for these two conditions radius of gyration that is denoted by k is equal to root under moment of inertia by m okay so here moment of inertia for the first condition is m r square by 2 and we have to divide it by m and then root over so here we'll get root under r square by 2 that means r by root 2 okay similarly for second condition we have root under m r square by 4 divided by m that means root under r square by 4 that is equal to r by 2 okay so suppose this is k1 this is k2 then we have to find out the ratio of these two so what will be the ratio k1 by k2 will be equal to r by root 2 into 2 by r okay so r r cancelled 2 by root 2 that means root 2 into 2 okay in place of 2 we can write root 2 into root 2 and here root 2 so 1 root 2 cancelled so what will be the ratio root 2 is to 1 okay so option b will be the correct answer question number 22 is from the chapter alternating current and the question is the peak voltage of the ac source is equal to option a the value of voltage supplied to the circuit option b the rms value of the ac source option c root 2 times the rms value of the ac source and option d 1 by root 2 times the rms value of the ac source so this is very simple it is known fact that it is root 2 times the rms value of the ac source so option c is the correct answer okay we know that the rms value of the ac source that means e rms is equal to e not by root 2 where e not is the peak value okay so what will be the peak value e not will be equal to root 2 times the e rms okay so option c is the answer question number 23 is related to work energy and power and the question is the energy that will be ideally radiated by a 100 kw transmitter in 1 hour is okay so here simply we know that energy is equal to power into time because power is equal to energy by time so energy will be power into time okay now power is given as 100 kw that means how many watts 100 into 10 to the power 3 watts okay and time is 1 hour that means 60 into 60 seconds okay so here we'll get 100 that means 10 to the power 2 plus 10 to the power 3 so 10 to the power 5 into 16 into 60 is 3600 okay so here we can write it like this 36 into 10 to the power 7 and the unit for energy will be joule so the correct option will be option a right
Now, question number 24 is from the chapter Wave Optics and the question is, in a Young's double slit experiment, a student observes 8 fringes in a certain segment of screen when a monochromatic light of 600 nanometer wavelength is used. If the wavelength of light is changed to 400 nanometer, then the number of fringes he would observe in the same region of the screen is. Okay, so suppose this is the segment of the screen. And here it is given that the number of fringes observed in first case is 8. Whereas number of fringes observed in second case is unknown and it has to be found out. Okay. Now the wavelength used in the first case that means lambda 1 is 600 nanometer. Whereas the wavelength used in the second case is 400 nanometer according to the question. Okay. Now suppose that the length of the segment is i then i will remain same in both the cases okay because the same segment has been observed twice now i is equal to the number of fringes that is n into beta that means fringe width okay beta is the fringe width also beta that is fringe width is equal to lambda into capital d by small d okay so here we know that i remains same that means n into beta will remain constant okay so let's put the values n1 beta 1 will be equal to n2 beta 2 right and n1 is 8 beta 1 will be lambda 1 into capital d by small d and n2 is unknown and beta 2 is lambda 2 into capital D by small d, right? So capital D, capital D cancel, small d, small d cancel. So here 8 into lambda 1 that means 600 nanometer is equal to n2 into lambda 2 that means 400 nanometer, okay? So what will be the value of n2? It will be 8 into 600 divided by 400 okay it will be the number of fringes in the second case that is n2 so it will come out to be 12 okay so here option d will be the correct answer question number 25 is from the chapter electromagnetic induction and the question is a square loop of side 1 meter and resistance 1 ohm is placed in a magnetic field of 0.5 tesla if the plane of the loop is perpendicular to the direction of magnetic field, then the magnetic flux through the loop is, okay? So, let's understand the diagram first. Suppose this is the square loop, okay? And it is given that the plane of this loop, that means this thing, is perpendicular to the direction of magnetic field, okay? So, this is the magnetic field here. Now, here we have to find the angle between the magnetic field and the area vector that means normal to the plane. Okay, so this is the normal to the plane and the angle between the magnetic field and the normal is 0 degree because both are in same direction. So, theta is 0 degree here. Okay, now we can write that the magnetic flux that is phi is equal to vector B dot vector A. So, B is the magnetic field and A is the area vector. Okay, so it is equal to B A cos theta. Now B that means magnetic field is given as 0.5 tesla. Area will be side square that means 1 meter square and cos theta that means cos 0 degree. Okay. So it will be 1 into 0.5 that will be equal to 0.5. Okay. And cos 0 degree will be 1. So it will be 0.5 Weber. Okay. So the correct answer will be option B. Question number 26 is from the chapter current electricity and the question is two resistors of resistance 100 ohm and 200 ohm are connected in parallel in an electrical circuit. The ratio of thermal energy developed in 100 ohm to that in 200 ohm in a given time is. Okay. So here R1 that is the first resistance is 100 ohm whereas R2 is 200 ohm. Right. Now, suppose the thermal energy developed in R1 is H1, whereas the thermal energy developed in R2 is H2, okay? Now, we know that the thermal energy or the heat energy is given as 
I square R T. Okay, here I is the current, R is the resistance, and T is the time. So if in place of I we write V by R, that means potential difference by R, then we'll get V by R square into R T. So here we'll get V square T by R, right? So in case of parallel resistance, potential difference remains same, right? And here time is also same because we have to find in a given time. So the thermal energy will be inversely proportional to R, okay? Now we have to find the ratio of thermal energy in first case to second case. So H1 by H2 will be equal to R2 by R1 because they are inversely proportional. So it will be equal to R2 that means 200 ohm divided by R1 that means 100 ohm. Okay. So here we'll get 2 is to 1. So option B will be the correct answer. Question number 27 is from the chapter motion in a straight line and the question is the ratio of the distances traveled by a freely falling body in the first, second, third and fourth second. Okay, so we know that the distance traveled in nth second is given as u plus half a into 2n minus 1. So here u is the initial velocity, a is the acceleration and n is the time. Okay, so before the body was released, it was at rest. That means the initial velocity was 0. Okay, also the acceleration in case of freely falling body is g that means acceleration due to gravity okay so we can say that the distance traveled in ns second is simply half g into 2n minus 1 right so n will be the given time so now we'll put the values of n one by one so for the first second what will be the value of s it will be equal to half g into 2 into 1 minus 1 okay so here we'll get 2 into 1 that means 2 minus 1 is 1 so it will be half g only okay now for the second second so it will be half g 2 into 2 minus 1 here n is equal to 2 so 2 into 2 is 4 minus 1 is 3 so here we'll get 3 into half g right for the third second it will be half g here 2 into 3 minus 1 that means 6 minus 1 is 5 so it will be 5 into half g so because half g is common in all i'm taking it separately okay similarly for fourth second it will be half g into 2 into 4 minus 1 that means 8 minus 1 is 7 into half g okay so here you can see half g is common so it will be cancelled and the ratio of s first to s second to s third to s fourth will come out to be 1 is to 3 is to 5 is to 7 right so option c will be the correct answer Question number 28 is from the chapter gravitation and the question is a body of mass 60 gram experiences a gravitational force of 3 newton when placed at a particular point. The magnitude of the gravitational field intensity at that point is, okay. So gravitational field intensity is written as Eg, okay. So here we should remember that force is equal to mass into gravitational field intensity. That means the gravitational field intensity will be equal to force divided by mass, right? Now here force is given as 3 Newton and mass is 60 grams. So 60 grams means 60 into 10 to the power minus 3 kg, right? So here we'll write in kg that means 60 into 10 to the power minus 3, okay? Now let's solve it. It will be equal to 3 by 6 into 10 to the power minus 2 here we can write, okay? So that will be equal to 0 0.5 into 10 to the power 2 that means 50 and the unit will be Newton per kg because it is force by mass right. So which answer will be correct? Option B will be the correct answer. 
Now question number 29 is from the chapter Ray Optics and Optical Instruments and the question is a light ray falls on a glass surface of refractive index root 3 at an angle 60 degree. The angle between the refracted and reflected rays would be okay. So first we have to find the angle of refraction and angle of reflection and then we'll find the angle between them okay. So suppose this is the glass material. This is the normal that means the perpendicular. So according to this question, the light ray falls at an angle 60 degree. That means the angle of incidence is 60 degree. Then what will be the angle of reflection? It will also be equal to 60 degree. Okay, because angle of incidence is equal to angle of reflection. So we have got the angle of reflection as 60 degree. Next, we have to find the angle of refraction. Okay, and for refraction, we use the formula mu1 sin i equals to mu2 sin r. So here I'm writing r dash for the angle of refraction. Okay, now mu1 is the refractive index of the first medium from where the light has come. So by default, we'll take it as air. So the refractive index of air is 1. So mu1 will be equal to 1 into sine i that means sine 60 degree equals to mu2 that means the refractive index of the glass that is given as root 3 into sine r dash okay sine 60 degree is equal to root 3 by 2 so that is equal to root 3 into sine r dash so root 3 root 3 cancelled that means sine r dash equals to half okay sine r dash equals to half so what will be the value of r dash that means angle of refraction it will be equal to sin inverse half that will come out to be 30 degree okay you know that sin 30 degree is equal to half so we have got the angle of refraction as well it is 30 degree so if this is the refracted ray look at the figure then its angle with the normal that means this one is the r dash that is 30 degree okay now look at this complete angle this complete this is the normal so all the angles towards the right side of the angle uh, towards the right side of the normal will sum up and make 180 degree okay that means 60 degree that is angle of reflect reflection plus the angle between the angle of reflection and refraction suppose this is theta plus this angle of refraction that means 30 degree will get added to 180 degree okay that means 90 degree plus theta will be 180 degree so theta will come out to be 180 degree minus 90 that means 90 degree okay so the angle between the angle of reflection and refraction is 90 degree so option c is the correct answer question number 30 is again related to ray optics and the question is when light propagates through a material medium of relative permittivity epsilon r and relative permeability mu r, then the velocity of light v is given by. Okay, c is the velocity of light in vacuum. So we have to find the expression for velocity of light. Right now we know that the permittivity of a medium epsilon m is given as epsilon naught into epsilon r, where epsilon naught is the permittivity of free space or absolute permittivity and epsilon r is the relative permittivity okay similarly the permeability of a medium is equal to mu naught into mu r that means the product of absolute permeability into the relative permeability okay now velocity is given as 1 by root under epsilon m into mu m that means the product of permittivity of a medium and permeability of a medium okay now we can write the values of epsilon m and epsilon mu m from these two equations. So we can write it like this 1 by root under epsilon naught epsilon r into mu naught into mu r right. Also we can write the epsilon naught mu naught separately that means 1 by root under epsilon naught mu naught and here we can write 1 by root under epsilon r and mu r together okay so we know that the 
velocity of light in vacuum that means c is given as 1 by root under epsilon not mu not okay so the first portion this portion will be equal to c okay so v will be equal to what c into 1 by root under epsilon r mu r okay or we can write c divided by root under epsilon r mu r so which will be the correct answer option d will be the correct answer question number 31 is from the chapter electrostatic potential and capacitance and the question is two hollow conducting spheres of radii r1 and r2 such that r1 is greater than r2 have equal charges the potential would be options are more on bigger sphere more on smaller sphere equal on both the spheres and dependent on the material property of the sphere okay so suppose this is the bigger sphere and this is the smaller sphere so let the radius of the bigger sphere as r1 and the radius of the smaller sphere is r2 because it is given that r1 is greater than r2 right now we know that the potential of a conducting hollow sphere hollow sphere is given as k into q by r where k is a constant q is the charge and r is the radius of the sphere right and here it is given that the they have equal charges that means q will be same so the potential will vary inversely with the radius okay so we can say that v1 by v2 will be equal to r2 by r1 okay that means the smaller the radius more will be the potential so the smaller radius has more potential okay whereas the larger radius has lower potential okay so option b will be the correct answer question number 32 is from the chapter current electricity and the question is a copper wire of length 10 meter and radius 10 to the power minus 2 by root pi meter has electrical resistance of 10 ohm the current density in the wire for an electric field strength of 10 volt per meter is okay so we have to determine the current density now we know that resistance is equal to rho into l by a where rho is the resistivity of the material of wire and it is a constant right l is the length and a is the area of wire so what will be the value of rho it will be equal to r into a by l right also we know that resistivity is the inverse of conductivity that means sigma okay sigma is the conductivity of the wire so if in place of resistivity we write conductivity then we'll get conductivity that is sigma equals to l by r into a that means just the inverse of resistivity okay inverse of resistivity now we have to find the current density so what is the formula to find current density it is denoted by the letter j right so this is equal to sigma into electric field that means l by r a into electric field okay so let's put the values here length is 10 meter so 10 into electric field is given as 10 volt per meter so again 10 divided by resistance that means 10 ohm into area and area is pi r square so here we have pi into r square that means 10 to the power minus 2 by root pi square okay so now if we solve it we'll get 10 into 10 that means 100 divided by 10 pi into 10 to the power minus 4 by pi okay so this is the square of this one that means the square of radius okay now on solving this we'll get 10 to the power 5 and the unit will be ampere per meter square okay so this will be the answer that means option d will be the correct answer now question number 33 is from the chapter motion in a straight line and the question is the displacement time graphs of two moving particles make angles of 30 degree and 45 degree with the x axis as shown in the figure 
the ratio of their respective velocity is okay so here we have the displacement time graph and we know that the slope of a displacement time graph gives us the velocity okay so here the first angle mentioned is 30 degree that means the slope making an angle of 30 degree represent the first velocity that means v1 and the slope making an angle of 45 degree with the x-axis is v2 okay now how do we calculate the slope slope is calculated as tan theta okay so simple so v1 is the slope 1 and v2 is the slope 2 so we can say that v1 by v2 will be equal to tan theta 1 by tan theta 2 right we have to find the v1 by v2 okay ratio of two velocities so tan theta 1 will be equal to tan 30 degree and tan theta 2 is tan 45 degree okay now what is the value of tan 30 degree it is 1 by root 3 and tan 45 degree is 1 so the ratio will be 1 is to root 3 okay that means option d will be the correct answer question number 34 is from the chapter units and dimensions and the question is plane angle and solid angle have units but no dimensions dimensions but no units no units and no dimensions or both units and dimensions okay so let's talk about plane angle first what is plane angle it is equal to r divided by radius okay and unit of plane angle is radian we often use this word radian right now we'll see the dimension of plane angle so arc is measured in terms of length so L and radius is also measured in terms of length. So length and length cancelled. That means no dimension. So plane angle is dimensionless. Now we'll talk about the solid angle. Solid angle is equal to area divided by radius square. Okay. And the unit of solid angle is steradian that means it also has unit but dimension is again area is l square and radius square will also be l square then again cancelled and it will be also dimensionless so we can say that both plane angle and solid angle have units but no dimension okay so option a will be the correct answer Question number 35 is from the chapter atoms and the question is let T1 and T2 be the energy of an electron in the first and second excited states of hydrogen atoms respectively. According to the Bohr's model of an atom the ratio T1 is to T2 is. Okay. So here first we should remember that the first orbit that means n equals to 1 is not the excited state of an electron. Okay. So do not confuse with the first excited state. First excited state starts with second orbit that means n equals to 2. Okay. Similarly n equals to 3 will be the second excited state. So here according to this question n1 that means the first excited state is 2 and n2 is 3. Right. First and second excited state. Now we have to find the energy. So the formula for energy of an electron in the nth orbit is minus 13.6 by n square electron volt. That means energy is inversely proportional to n square. Okay. So here energy is T1 and T2 respectively. So T1 by T2 will be equal to n2 square by n1 square right because these are inversely proportional now n2 is 3 so 3 square by n1 square that means 2 square so 3 square is 9 and 2 square is 4 that means answer will be 9 is to 4 so option d will be the correct answer 
Question number 36 is from the chapter gravitation and here we have to match list 1 with the correct option in list 2. Okay, So in list 1 we have some quantities related to gravitation. So we have to match them with their dimensions. So the first one is gravitational constant. We know that force is given as G into M1 into M2 by R square where M1 and M2 are masses and R is the radius. Okay. So what will be the value of G? It will be equal to force into radius square divided by mass 1 into mass 2. Okay. Now the dimension for force is MLT minus 2 and the dimension for radius square will be L square because radius is measured in terms of length and M1 into M2 will be M into M. Right. So 1M will be cancelled. So what is left here? M minus 1. L3 because 1L is here, 2L here, so 3 and T minus 2. Okay, that means the correct option for A will be number 2. Now, the second one is gravitational potential energy. Now, potential energy that is denoted by U is given as M into G into H, right? So, the dimension for M will be M only. G is the acceleration due to gravity. So the dimension for acceleration is LT minus 2 and H is height. So it is measured in length. That means L. Okay. So what will be the dimension M L2, 1L here, 1L here, T minus 2. Okay. So option 4. So the correct match for B is number 4. Right. Now we come to the third one. Here we have gravitational potential. So what is gravitational potential? It is equal to potential energy that means U divided by M. So here we just found out the dimension for potential energy. It is M L 2 T minus 2 divided by M. That means M will be cancelled out. So only L 2 T minus 2 will be left. That means number 1 will be the correct match for C. Okay. Now the fourth one and the last one is gravitational intensity. So how do we write gravitational intensity? It is equal to force divided by mass. So force is what? M L T minus 2 and mass. So M will be cancelled. So only L T minus 2 will be left. That means option 3. This, time, this side third one will be the correct match for D. Okay. So out of the given options, option B will be the correct answer. Question number 37 is from the chapter oscillations and the question is two pendulums of length 121 centimeter and 100 centimeter start vibrating in phase. At some instant, the two are at their mean position in the same phase. Okay. So the minimum number of vibrations of the shorter pendulum after which the two are again in phase at the mean position is. Okay. So we know that the time period of a pendulum is given as 2 pi root under L by G. So L is the length of the pendulum and G is the acceleration due to gravity. Okay. That means T is directly proportional to root L. Okay. Now L1 is given as 121 centimeter and L2 is given as 100 centimeter. Right. Now if we find T1 by T2 then it will be equal to root under 121 divided by root under 100. Okay. So here we will get 11 divided by 10. Right. Because root of 121 is 11 and root of 100 is 10. So here we can write that 10 T1 is equal to 11 T2. What does this mean? This means that T2 is the time period of the shorter pendulum. That means after completion of 11th oscillation of shorter pendulum, it will be in phase with the longer pendulum. Okay. So this is what we have to answer here. So option A will be the correct answer. 11 is the minimum number of vibrations of shorter pendulum. Now question number 38 is from the chapter units and measurement and the question is the area of a rectangular field in meter square of length 55.3 meter mm -hmm. and breadth 25 meter after rounding off the value for correct significant digits is. Okay. So we know that the area of a rectangular field is given as length 
into breadth right now length is given as 55.3 meter and breadth is given as 25 meter so on multiplying it we'll get 1382.5 meter square now we have to round it off so how many digits we have to consider see length has how many significant digits 1 2 and 3 and breadth has only two significant digits so we have to consider the minimum one that means two significant digits has to be considered okay so here if we round it off to two digits so here 1 2 that means it will be 13.82 into 10 to the power 2 meter square so if we round it off we'll get 14 into 10 to the power 2 meter square so option d will be the correct answer now question number 39 is related to motion in a plane and the question is a ball is projected with a velocity 10 meter per second at an angle of 60 degree with the vertical direction its speed at the highest point of its trajectory will be okay so suppose this is the y axis this is the x axis okay so the ball is projected like this the speed of the ball is given as 10 meter per second this is the u and it makes an angle 60 degree with the vertical that means with the y axis but we have to consider the angle with the horizontal so the angle with the horizontal that means theta is equal to 90 minus 60 that means 30 degree okay so theta is 30 degree now we know that the velocity at any point in two dimension is equal to the sum of x component and y component of velocities okay because the velocity has two components and x component is what u cos theta where theta is the angle with horizontal and y component is u sin theta right also what happens at the highest point the y component becomes zero so only x component remains so at the highest point u will be equal to u cos theta u is 10 meter per second cos theta means cos 30 degree and cos 30 degree is what root 3 by 2 so 2 into 5 is 10 that means 5 root 3 meter per second is the velocity at the highest point okay that means option b is the correct answer question number 40 is from the chapter semiconductor electronics and here we have to find the correct truth table for the given logic circuit okay so in the given circuit you can see there are three gates gate a gate b and gate c so gate a is the nand gate why because this symbol represents an and gate okay and here we have a bubble like structure with and that means it represents a not so this complete symbol is not and that means nand so in the similar manner b will also be the nand gate but c is the and gate because there is no bubble like structure here okay now let's write down the inputs and outputs of these three gates here so a b and c for a what are the inputs a and b okay this is a this is b so output we know that we write a dot b for and gate but here we have nand that means a bar will also be present okay so a dot b bar now for b you can see that a is passing through a not gate before coming to b so it will be a bar and b okay so what will be the output for this it will be a bar dot b and then again a bar got it now for c we know that the outputs of a and b are the inputs of c so one one input will be a dot b bar and the other will be a bar dot b bar okay so what will be the output of c this dot this okay so a dot b bar dot a bar dot b bar okay so now we have got the output of c now let's write it again c is equal to i'm writing simply ab so ab dot a bar b bar okay now if we take the b common then what will be left here 
it will be a plus a bar and then complete bar okay on all also we know that a plus a bar is equal to 1 okay so it is simply b bar so you can say that c is equal to b bar that means the value of c will be just the opposite of b that means if b is 1 then c will be 0 if b is 0 then c will be 1 got it so these cannot be same okay now let's have a look at the options in the first one you can see that b and c are both 0 so this is not possible because they cannot be same okay in the second one uh, 0 1 1 0 but again 0 0 so both are same again not possible okay so the third one is 0 1 1 0 0 1 1 0 so yes this is possible because b and c are opposite in all the cases okay but let's have a look at the last one as well here we can see that again in the first one only it is clear that this is not possible because both values are 0 okay so only option c is the correct one question number 41 is from the chapter moving charges and magnetism and the question is from ampere's circuital law for a long straight wire of circular cross section carrying a steady current the variation of magnetic field in the inside and outside region of the wire is okay so if this is a current carrying wire then we have to compare the magnetic field at some point inside the wire and outside the wire okay option a is it will be uniform and remains constant for both the regions option b a linearly increasing function of distance up to the boundary of the wire and then linearly decreasing for outside region okay option c is a linearly increasing function of distance r up to the boundary and then decreasing one with one by r dependence for the outside region and option d is a linearly decreasing function of the distance up to the boundary and then linearly increasing one for the outside region okay so here you can simply solve this if you remember the formula for magnetic field we know that for any inside point of a solid current carrying wire the magnetic field is given as mu naught i r divided by r square into 2 pi okay so small r is any point inside the wire so we can say that b is directly proportional to r okay similarly for any outside point we know that magnetic field is given as mu naught i by 2 pi r so you have to remember this formula so here you can say that magnetic field is inversely proportional to r so if we draw a graph for inside and outside point so if this is the radius okay this is the boundary so till the boundary that means for any point inside the wire it will be linearly proportional to the distance to this point okay so there will be a linear graph till the radius and then after that it will be inversely proportional to r that means the graph will look something like this okay so which option will be correct option c will be correct that it will be a linearly increasing function of distance r up to the boundary okay this is the boundary and then decreasing one with one by r dependence got it question number 42 is from the chapter alternating current and the question is a series lcr circuit with inductance 10 henry capacitance 10 microfarad and resistance 50 ohm is connected to an ac source of voltage v equals to 200 sin 100 t volt if the resonant frequency of the lcr is v naught and the frequency of the ac source is v then in the options the possible values of v naught and v are given okay so we know that omega is equal to 1 by root under lc right so l is the inductance and c is the capacitance so now if we put the values of inductance and capacitance inductance is 10 henry so 10 and capacitance is 10 microfarad that means 10 into 10 to the power minus 6 farad okay now here it will be 1 by root under minus 6 plus 2 that means minus 4 so it will be 1 by 10 to the power minus 2 and that is equal to 100 right so omega is equal to 100 now we know that omega is equal to 2 pi into f that is frequency okay so f will be equal to what omega by 2 pi 
so now f not is equal to omega that means 100 we have just found out the value of omega by 2 pi so here we'll get 2 into 50 is 100 so it will be 50 by pi hertz so this is the resonant frequency right now here we are given that the voltage of the AC source is what 200 sine 100 T so the general form is what V naught sine omega T that means omega is 100 here okay so we can say that omega is 100 again we can find out the frequency of the AC source that means omega by 2 pi so omega is 100 in this case as well by 2 pi that means again 50 by pi hertz okay so you can see that the frequency resonant frequency and frequency of AC source both are equal that is equal to 50 by pi hertz that means option b is the correct answer question number 43 is from the chapter electric charges and fields and the question is two point charges minus q and plus q are placed at a distance of l as shown in the figure the magnitude of electric field intensity at a distance r where r is greater than l varies as okay so suppose this is minus q charge this is plus q then the distance between them is capital l now we have to find out the variation in electric field intensity at certain distance r which is greater than l okay so now this is an electric dipole right so the electric field intensity that means e is given as 2p divided by 4 pi epsilon naught into r q so this is the formula that you have to remember again this is directly formula based question so p is equal to q into l that means the product of individual charge and the distance between the two charges this is dipole moment p is dipole moment okay so here we can just notice that electric field intensity is inversely proportional to r cube that means the electric field intensity will vary inversely with the r cube okay so option b will be the correct answer Question number 44 is from the chapter mechanical properties of solids and the question is given below are two statements one is labeled as assertion and the other is labeled as reason so first statement that means assertion is the stretching of a spring is determined by the shear modulus of the material of the spring and the reason is a coil spring of copper has more tensile strength than the steel spring of the same dimension okay so see first statement that means assertion is true because in case of stretching of spring only shape changes okay so there is no change in length or volume of the material only shape changes therefore it is determined by the shear modulus got it so let me write it therefore only shear modulus is considered now in reason first of all this is not the reason for the first statement and then secondly the statement is also incorrect because the tensile strength of steel is more than copper but here it is given that the copper has more tensile strength okay so tensile strength of copper is less than that of steel okay not more than so option c will be correct that a is true but r is false okay Question number 45 is from the chapter electromagnetic induction and the question is a big circular coil of 1000 turns and average radius 10 meter is rotating about its horizontal diameter at 2 per radian. If the vertical component of the earth's magnetic field at that place is 2 into 10 to the power minus 5 tesla and electrical resistance of the coil is 12.56 ohm then the maximum induced current in the coil will be okay. So what is given here number of turns that means n is given average radius small r is given 
2 per radian is the frequency that means omega is also given and magnetic field and electrical resistance are also given okay so we have to determine the maximum induced current that means i max in the coil now let's start with the magnetic flux we know that the magnetic flux is equal to n b a cos omega t right so here n is the number of turns p is the magnetic field and a is the area of the coil now EMF is given as minus d phi by dt that means on differentiating the flux we get the EMF right. So we have to differentiate this one and on differentiating the flux we will get minus nba omega minus sin omega t ok. So here minus minus will get plus so we will be writing here nba omega sin omega t. So this is the EMF. Now we have to find the I max that means maximum current. So for that we need to get the maximum EMF first right. So in case of maximum EMF this term sin omega t becomes 1. So maximum EMF will be equal to n b a omega only right. Now we have got the maximum EMF so we can easily find the maximum current by dividing maximum EMF by the electrical resistance. So maximum EMF is NBA omega divided by resistance. So let's put the values N is 1000. So here we can write 10 to the power 3. B that is magnetic field is 2 into 10 to the power minus 5 tesla. A is the area that means pi r square right. This is the area. So pi and r that means radius is 10 meter so 10 square will be what 100 that means we can write 10 square only okay into omega that is 2 per radian now here electrical resistance is 12.56 ohm now here this is 10 to the power 3 this is 10 to the power 2 so this is 10 to the power 5 okay 3 plus 2 is 5 and this side we have 10 to the power minus 5 so plus 5 minus 5 cancelled so what is left 2 into 2 that means 4 pi divided by 12.56 right and we know that pi is equal to 3.14 so 4 into 3.14 will be equal to 12.56 only so what will we get here 1 right so the answer will be 1 ampere that means option c will be the correct answer Question number 46 is from the chapter kinetic theory and the question is the volume occupied by the molecules contained in 4.5 kg water at STP if the intermolecular forces vanish away is ok. So STP means standard temperature and pressure. What is standard temperature? It is 0 degree Celsius or 273 Kelvin. Similarly standard pressure is 1 atmosphere that is equal to 10 to the power 5 Newton per meter square okay now from the ideal gas equation let me write it ideal gas equation is pv equals to nrt so p is the pressure v is the volume n is the number of moles r is the gas constant and t is the temperature so here we have to find out the volume v that will be equal to nrt divided by p right now n is the number of moles so what is the number of moles of water here it is equal to given mass by molar mass so given mass of water is 4.5 kg that means 4.5 into 10 to the power 3 grams divided by molar mass so molar mass of water is 18 so let's put this value 4.5 into 10 to the power 3 divided by 18 is the number of moles r is the gas constant that is equal to 8.3 P is the temperature that is equal to 273 Kelvin divided by pressure. So pressure is 10 to the power 5 Newton per meter square right. Now on solving this we will get 5.66 meter cube volume will be meter cube right. So option D will be the correct answer. Question number 47 is from the chapter electrostatic potential and capacitance and the question is a capacitor of capacitance 900 picofarad is charged fully by 100 volt battery B as shown in figure A. Then it is disconnected from the battery and connected to another uncharged capacitor of capacitance 900 picofarad as shown in figure B. 
then the electrostatic energy is stored by the system B in. Okay, so let's talk about the first system. That means system A. Here the capacitance is given as 900 picofarad. That means 900 into 10 to the power minus 12 farad, right? And the voltage or potential is given as 100 volt. So what will be the charge stored in the first capacitor? It will be C1 into V1. That means 900 into 10 to the power minus 12 farad into 100 volt. So on multiplying it, we'll get 9 into 10 to the power minus 8 and the unit will be coulomb, okay, for charge. Now the charge on the second capacitor is 0 because it is uncharged. So the C2 V2 is equal to 0, right? Now after this charged capacitor is connected to the uncharged capacitor, charge will start flowing from the former to the latter until they have a common potential, right? So here C1 V1 plus C2 V2, that means the charge on individual capacitors will be equal to the charge on the complete setup. That means C1 plus C2 into the common potential, okay? So what will be the common potential? It will be equal to C1 V1 plus C2 V2 divided by C1 plus C2. And here C1 V1 is 9 into 10 to the power minus 8. We have just found out. So 9 into 10 to the power minus 8 and C2 V2 is 0 because potential on the second one is 0. So, so the overall charge is also 0. And C1 plus C2 that means 900 plus 900 picofarad that means 1800 picofarad right so it is 1800 into 10 to the power minus 12 farad now if we solve it we'll get 100 divided by 2 that means 50 volts so this is the common potential of the setup what we have to find out we have to find out the energy stored electrostatic energy that is equal to half c1 plus c2 into square of common potential okay half we use half cv square for energy so here c is the c1 plus c2 that means half into c1 plus c2 is what 1800 picofarad that means 1800 into 10 to the power minus 12 farad and potential we have found out to be 50 volt so it will be 50 into 50 here on solving this we'll get 2.25 into 10 to the power minus 6 and the unit for energy will be joule. So what will be the correct answer? Option C will be the correct answer. Question number 48 is from the chapter current electricity and the question is a Wheatstone bridge is used to determine the value of unknown resistance X by adjusting the variable resistance Y as shown in the figure. For the most precise measurement of X, the resistances P and Q Options are should be approximately equal to 2x, should be approximately equal and are small, should be very large and unequal and the last option is do not play any significant role. So actually these resistance have significant role. We know that the measurement will be most precise when the Wheatstone bridge is most sensitive. Okay, And when is Wheatstone bridge most sensitive? when all the resistances are equal. So let's write it down. V-stone bridge is most sensitive when all the resistances are equal. Okay. So according to this, the correct option should be option B. P and Q should be approximately equal and small okay question number 49 is from the chapter ray optics and optical instruments and the question is two transparent media a and b are separated by a plane boundary the speed of light in those media are 1.5 into 10 to the power 8 meter per second and 2 into 10 to the power 8 meter per second respectively the critical angle for a ray of light for these two media is okay so we have two media A and B which are separated by a plane boundary. Now let's suppose that the refractive index of the medium A is mu1 and the refractive index of the medium B is mu2. Now it is given that the speed of light in the first medium is 
1.5 into 10 to the power 8 meter per second. This is V1, right? And the speed of light in the second medium is 2 into 10 to the power 8 meter per second. So here we can understand the speed of light is more in the second medium. That means the second medium is the rarer one, whereas the first medium is the denser medium, right? Now we have to find the critical angle. So what is critical angle? We know that whenever a ray of light passes from denser to rarer medium, then at some point the refracted ray, this ray makes an angle 90 degree with the normal. Okay, so the particular incident angle at which this 90 degree angle is made by the refracted ray is known as critical angle. So this is the critical angle. Okay, now we know that mu1 sin theta1 is equal to mu2 sin theta2. So mu1 is the refractive index of the first medium. Let's write it as mu1 only into sin theta1 that means sin of critical angle. Mu2 is the refractive index of the second medium and the theta here is that means refracted angle is angle of refraction is 90 degree. So this is sine 90 degree. So sine 90 degree is equal to 1 that means sine theta c that means the sine of critical angle is equal to mu2 divided by mu1. Okay. So we have to find the mu2 by mu1. We know that mu is equal to speed of light in vacuum divided by speed of light in that particular medium. Okay, So the refractive index is inversely proportional to the speed of light in that medium. So we can say that mu2 by mu1 will be equal to what? V1 by V2 because these are inversely proportional. So V1 is 1.5 into 10 to the power 8 meter per second and V2 is 2 into 10 to the power 8 meter per second. So the ratio will be 3 by 4, right? So this is the ratio for mu2 by mu1 as well. That means sin theta c is equal to 3 by 4. So what will be the value of theta c or the critical angle? It will be sin inverse 3 by 4. 3 by 4 is equal to what? 0.75. So we can say that it is equal to sin inverse 0.75. So this will be the answer. That means option c will be the correct answer. Now the last question is from the chapter nuclei and the question is a nucleus of mass number 189 splits into two nuclei having mass number 125 and 64. The ratio of radius of two daughter nuclei respectively is. Okay. So we know that the radius of the daughter nucleus after disintegration is equal to R0 a to the power 1 by 3 where R0 is the initial radius and A is the mass number of the nucleus, right? So we can say that the radius of the daughter nucleus is directly proportional to A to the power 1 by 3 or cube root of A, right? Now we have to find the ratio of radius that means R1 by R2. So that will be equal to A1 by A2 to the power 1 by 3. A1 is given as 125 and A2 is given as 64. So 1 by 3 power that means the cube root of these. So cube root of 125 is 5 and cube root of 64 is 4. So the ratio will be 5 is to 4. That means option C will be the correct answer.